This episode of the Elevate Your Leadership podcast is brought to you in part by iFly Virginia Beach Indoor Skydiving. At iFly Virginia Beach, we bring people together through the dream of flight. To learn more about our leadership development and team building, visit iFlyVirginiaBeach.com. Welcome to the Elevate Your Leadership podcast series with U.S. Navy Special Operations veteran, CEO, and hockey fanatic, Bob Pizzini. Bob discusses leadership, success, failure, defining moments, and hard lessons learned with guests who are intentional in their approach to leadership. Leadership is a perishable skill. Use it or lose it. In this series, entrepreneurs, industry executives, academics, public figures, and other highly effective professionals share their formulas for success with you. Okay, welcome everybody to this episode of Elevate Your Leadership with me, your host, Bob Pizzini. I like to interview guests who not only bring value to me and my organization, I lead a company with 35 people on the team, but I like to interview guests who are going to bring value to you and your organization. In my continuing series on women's leadership, it is a true privilege to have Carrie Garbus on the podcast today. Carrie has a very interesting and unique background, not one that we would normally encounter. Uh, Carrie is the CEO and founder of Ovation, a 30-person global training firm. Carrie has trained thousands of executives globally in professional presence and speaker development. She is certified as a business etiquette expert, an emotional intelligence expert, and a professional speech writer. McGraw-Hill is the publisher of her book, Presentation Skills for Managers. A professional actress since childhood, super cool, we're going to talk about that, Carrie began her studies in voice and theater at the Baltimore School for the Arts uh, before earning her BFA, that is a bachelor's in fine arts, I would imagine, in musical theater from Syracuse University. So you spent a little time in New York. That's cool. Carrie is also the founder of Be Ready, a nonprofit initiative offering Ovation's professional presence training to Black youth of America. Welcome, Carrie. Before I get into our discussion, is there any introductory things you would like to say? Thank you. I actually spent a lot of time in New York because after I graduated from college, I was a long, 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 and I can turn it on or off, New Yorker. That's the only amendment I'd like to make to my Okay. Bio. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So just for geographic reference, where's home and where do you work? Uh, now I am outside of Boston and it's where I work, play, live, breathe. Okay. Because we, we've always been a virtual company. So it uh, luckily, <laughs> the, yeah. we didn't have to do, there was no pivoting in terms of infrastructure wise when the pandemic hit. Let me just launch into life right now. So we didn't <laughs> have to redo anything infrastructure wise when everything was on lockdown. So we've always been a remote company. So work, life, breathe, play, all of it right outside of Boston after going Baltimore, New York, New York City for life, and then up here. So I guess my next home then will be Maine. I don't know when that's going to be. If I keep going on my Northern trajectory, we'll see. Okay. That means you like snow and lobster. Yes. Uh, and yes. All right. So with that, uh, let's kind of start with your comment there on the pandemic and the fact that it really didn't affect what you're doing and how you're doing it. Just kind of talk us through that. I'll tell you that when I got the notice from the governor of the state of Virginia that said on March 23rd, 2020, all businesses are instructed to close their doors. That was a harrowing time to say the least. How did that time frame in a similar order in Massachusetts affect you? I don't want to lay it out there that we were unaffected. We were completely affected by this global pandemic. The one thing that wasn't affected was the company infrastructure. So that was a, a coup in this awfulness that was the, this time that, that we're still emerging out of. Uh, we were just lucky that we didn't have a brick and mortar and a thing that people come to and try to fly in the air through like you do. So yeah, right. it wasn't quite the same. It hit us a little bit earlier. I was in Amsterdam the first week of March. Work, I'm a part of 
Entrepreneurs Organization, EO, which is a global organization of all, yeah, as you know. Yeah. I've had EO as clients, actually. It's pretty cool. Yes. Love. I'm a huge fan of EO. So there, I'm a part of the organization. I'm all, they're also a client as well. So they had asked if I would go work with a group of global entrepreneurs on storytelling in Amsterdam. And so I'm in Amsterdam the first week of March with mostly non-Americans. And I'm watching the news in Amsterdam. I'm talking to people from all over the world, Asia, Europe, everywhere. And the way they were talking about the pandemic was very different than it was being discussed here in the States. And I started to feel a panic come on. And I thought, oh, this is going to hit like a this, this train is coming. And I have to figure out how to get on it or get out of the way, whatever. So on the flight home back to Boston, it was March 6th, I rewrote my entire business plan. I spent the bulk of the six hours on that plan. Like, okay, what do we do? How do we shore up? Who do I have to lay off? Who do I have to furlough? Like, what do I have to do? Assuming that most of our revenue, because at that time, 99% of our training was in person. A little bit of it was virtual, but not very much. That's what I did. And the next day I... Uh, laid off two people the very next day. It was early. It was a, a good choice so that we could survive then the next 18 months to where we are today, which we did indeed survive. So there was uh, some gifts in there, the gift of time to be able to create some things that I've always wanted to that weren't possible with the pace that we were going prior to the pandemic. And also, uh, and still continue some very much hardships. Business was down tremendously. My business was down a little over 50%. Again, I got creative. There was very little crying in the corner and uh, just a little, but just yeah, yeah. stay healthy, I think. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit, sure. <laughs> just a little bit. So we're, we're coming out of it. I, I had had the best year. Ovation had had the best year we'd ever had in 2019. And we were on pace to do 30% over that in 2020. And then we were half than we did in 2020, in 2019. Yeah, incredible. It, it's been an incredible journey. And I hear this story from business owners frequently, how number one, they it was foggy. They didn't know what they were going to do, but they were going to do something. They were going to survive this one way or another. And I think those who survived, they made that determination early on. You might hear a F-18 jet flying overhead. I don't know if my mic is picking it up, but being here by the Master Jet Base in Virginia Beach, Virginia, Oceana uh, Master Jet Base. We get to hear the jets fly all the time. We call that the sound of freedom. But those who dedicated to surviving and thriving, I think have, and your story is, is no exception to that. I also had to go through a pivot with Elevate Your Leadership, my leadership offering, which was designed to, to take place on site at iFly Virginia Beach. You know, the flight experience the expansion of the comfort zone, the facing your challenges or facing new challenges. That's all part of the leadership development experience. And I literally had to turn that into a webinar. And that has turned out to be highly successful. And it's, it's another product line or another offering that I have. So I've gone back to live events and then I've got the webinar as well. But what's important there is you led your organization through that very deliberately. And again, this is a, a podcast about leadership. Can you kind of share some of those defining moments or, you know, some of the leadership challenges you faced? You had that you already mentioned you had to lay two people off. I went through that discussion with some teammates as well. And it's it was not pleasant for anybody to for us to have to go through that. What were some of the other kind of from from a leadership perspective, some of the challenges you faced? Well, one of the big challenges comes from that all the facilitators for Ovation, which is the bulk of my company, we have other business leaders that that are in operations, all the facilitators are professional actors like myself. So not only did the work at Ovation almost evaporate, all theater and film and television evaporated as well. All of a sudden, I felt very responsible for people's work, money, of which I, I didn't have much to dole out work-wise, and really their mental health. It's hard enough being an actor, of which I've done forever, and keeping in a positive mindset and keep going. It's very much you have to have an entrepreneurial spirit to stay positive and move forward as an actor with all the rejection and the downtime. All of a sudden, nobody could do anything. People were just home doing nothing. So 
I thought, okay, now more than ever, we have, I've got to help people find a release or some sort of bright spot or something where we can come and vent. And so at the very, very beginning, I started with something called Mental Health Mondays. And so I opened a Zoom room for two hours in the afternoon, every Monday, you could drop in, you could bring a drink, you could bring a musical instrument, you could bring a cat, like whatever you need to do and just chit chat. And that worked really well. And people were saying from the team, well, how long are you going to do this? And I said, I'm going to do it until, uh, until I don't know, but until. So those we did weekly that went really, really well. And then of course, as things, luckily some television film got started over the summer, last summer, which was great with really good testing uh, that started to die off a little bit. And I just started getting super creative with the mental health and engagement of my team. Uh, so I was doing lots of different initiatives. I hired a couple different experiences on virtually that we could have as a team. So I got a friend who does meditation. We ran a meditation class. I had another friend who runs improv classes. She came on and, and did an improv class. And then I also ran this thing called book time with the boss. <laughs> and so they could go on book anytime, you know, any of my open times. And all they had to do was tell me what to wear or what to bring into the Zoom room. And people got really creative. So I did everything for, I did a CrossFit workout. I did cooking, yoga, somebody wanted me to, and I did it dress up as a princess and have a tea party. So anything just to, to keep people engaged. And that's something that I'm pretty proud of that I was yeah. able to keep going. And really, look, I, I own a communication skills training firm. So I over-communicated the hell out of this pandemic. Like, Yeah, I think that's critical. From a, Again, from a leadership perspective, you did exactly what good leaders do in that case. They keep everybody engaged and not only communicate, but over communicate. Yeah. So well done. And that, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head. You felt personally responsible for the livelihood of everybody on your team. And I think leaders should feel that way. They should think that way and they should feel that way. We are personally responsible for everybody's livelihood. My teammates, people who work for me, they have children. For me, my children are teenagers it was nowhere near as difficult to get through this as it was for somebody who works for me who has kids that are 10 and 11 years old. And now mom and dad became homeschoolers. So there was a lot of support required for the team. And as a leader, you really, you got to think about the livelihood of your teammates and, and keep them on board, you know, keep them on the team. So mm -hmm. congratulations. Well done on your part. You also mentioned something that I think is interesting from the acting perspective. Leadership is performance. And leaders, sometimes, I don't want to say we act or we're doing a stage performance, but in some capacity, we are. Do you discuss that? Is that part of your offering or what is your perspective on that? Absolutely. There is a less acting in terms of how I would define acting, but a, a professional presence aspect to leadership. So what that means is for leaders and yes, absolutely something we, we train, we discuss is that, uh, well, we want to maintain our authenticity here out in the world. And as we're leading, uh, perhaps we need to think about it as a strategic aut authenticity so that if I'm having a crappy day, my team, my clients don't need, to, my audiences don't need to be burdened with what a crappy day I'm having. So I need to be strategically authentic in that moment. Is that what I would define as acting? No. Is that maybe what from an outsider, a non-actor may say like, oh sure, you're acting, you're performing. So whatever the words are, yeah, absolutely. That we have to have a, a professional presence and, and put on that, that coat or that shirt and know what that looks like, sounds like, and feels like so that we can put it on when we need to. You know, one of the things I talk about uh, when I talk about the autonomic nervous system, sympathetic response and parasympathetic response, et cetera, my methodology and what I firmly believe in is somebody could bring me information that's very bad news. And my response would be, really, how did that happen? Or they could bring me information that's very good, very exciting news. And my response would be, really, really? how did that how happen? Did that happen? <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
So, yeah. So you want to be measured. You want to be in control of yourself first and foremost. You are performing to some level, I should say. Yeah, yeah. It is performance. And that's a key component of leadership. And I think that that has to be in a leader's conscious for them to, to perform appropriately for the situation. So you also, you've trained thousands of executives internationally and obviously across the United States. Are there common things you encounter? Are there common themes that you see that leaders maybe aren't doing right that you can easily remedy? Or, you know, what has all your years of doing this taught you? So many things. (laughs) One common thing that I see is a a small common thing, I should say, is this belief of, I don't need to rehearse or prepare. I'm smart. I'm seasoned. I know when I'm going to go talk about or deliver or when I deliver bad news. And so like, I don't need to, I just need to think about it. I don't actually need to prepare or rehearse it. I have seen and believe that's a big misstep. I understand leaders are busy and we don't have time. Rehearsal can seem very elementary because it is, it's rehearsal or saying the words out loud. So if I, if I have to deliver bad news to you, it's harder emotionally to say those words out loud. So why would I want to say it out loud multiple times and then deliver the bad news to you? Mm -hmm. The misstep is that your emotions will lessen, will lower every time that you say those words out loud. So the same way that you're in control with the good news and the bad news, Bob, that you were articulating two seconds ago, if I have to deliver bad news to you, I'm going to be much more in control if I have said those words out loud. Likewise, if I'm super excited about something and everyone's getting a big bonus and hooray, I still (laughs) want to be calm, easy to follow leader. I want to say those words out loud. So I'm more controlled me personally, or my team is always pushing towards rehearsal with accountability. And it doesn't have to take a ton of time, but you do need to say words out loud. You know, so brilliant. So brilliant. I served in the Navy for 26 years, U S Navy special operations. We rehearse the mission. We literally call it rehearsal. We rehearse the mission time and time again. If it's an underwater mission, we call it dirt diving. We dirt dive. So we, you know, we go outside in the parking lot and we walk through what the diving profile is going to look like. Rehearsal is critical. I rehearsed for this podcast discussion today. Am I pronouncing your last name the right way? I also mentioned that we're going to take a commercial break for capitalism, which we're going to do right now. So folks, great discussion with Carrie. We are going to take a quick break for capitalism back in a minute. And we are back with Carrie Garbus having an incredible discussion about uh, performance and leadership and critical components of a leader. And Carrie said that rehearsal is what she recommends more than anything else. But you said something else that's critical. You said that the more you rehearse, the more times you say it, emotions will lower. So if you have to deliver very bad information or very good information or have that difficult discussion, rehearse it, lower the emotional state to enable you to see clearly and get through that. One of the other things I talk about in Elevate Your Leadership is the fact that musicians rehearse and athletes train, train, train. Practice, game, tournament, championship. Yes. And And leadership is no different. Daily, daily rehearsals, listening to this podcast is a practice, if you will, or it's a training event for those who are truly interested in being good leaders. Yeah, training is, we talk about training all the time and getting good habits into your muscle memory. It's the same thing that when I'm at the gym, I'm making sure my form is good to lift healthfully so I can lift a good amount of weight And when I'm not thinking about it, just my muscles do it in the right form. The same thing for your communication skills and your presence. You can train that stuff and get productive habits in your muscle memory so that when it comes time to deliver the difficult news or the inspirational talk that you are not standing in front of people thinking, what does my face look like? What should I be doing with my hands? Am I saying filler words? You're just delivering the news in a engaging, authentic manner. And the other part of that is whoever is the recipient, whoever you're speaking to, they see your level of comfort yes. and their ability to really receive your message 
is kind of influenced a little bit by their perception of your level of comfort in delivering that message. Super cool. Let's talk a little bit about women's leadership and women in leadership. Do you give advice? Do you say, if you're a woman in a leadership position, you should dot, dot, dot? Or do you have specific training programs for women in leadership positions? We do have specific targeted training for women because there is a difference. I wish I could say it's totally equitable and everything's the same and nobody's, there's no gender bias. And there absolutely is. And there are things that as women, we need to be aware of and perhaps define our presence a little differently than we would recommend for a male leader. There are things that men do not have to think about that that women do that we have to be aware of. Can you give an example of that? Yes. And back to what we were just talking about is emotion is one of them. It is common that a if a woman becomes emotional in in any direction, right? So angry or absolutely highly elated or any of the gazillion emotions in between is that can often be perceived as a negative. Oh, she's so emotional. Oh, it's a specific time in this woman's month or life is common to be referred to, unfortunately. And, or that oh, she's crying because she's happy. She's crying because she's sad. Oh, weak. That's weak. Whereas if we see a male leader who is strong enough to stand in, and this is extremes, by the way, what we see a man standing in front of a group of people, and perhaps he's so moved by whatever's happening, he's brought to tears. Often that's referred to as like, oh, look, what a strong man. Look at, he is so strong and comfortable in his vulnerability or he's a very strong leader and he doesn't take any crap. And so he's the strong leader. And guess what? She saying the same things in the same manner could be referred to as, I don't know if I'm allowed to curse on this podcast, but you know, other- (laughs) The B word, the B word, yeah. Uh, That's come up in other female leaders that I've interviewed. So there is continuity there for sure. Well, I'll tell you my own experience. In 2018, my company received the Small Business of the Year Award. And there were about 500 people gathered for the ceremony. And I got called up to the stage and and in my thank yous, I got emotional, you know, and I didn't feel strong at the moment. I'll tell you that. I wish I wouldn't have gotten emotional in that moment. But the other thing you said is very true. People afterwards, they were like, wow, that was moving. How, um, how, you know, how comfortable you must be or whatever. And I was like, that was not comfortable, but, right. but you know, the, the crowd's reaction versus the way I thought was completely different. You know, they did take it as a, as a sign of strength, just like you said. So I've, I've experienced that. You know, the other thing I'll say, and I've said this in other podcasts is whenever I hear somebody say as a woman leader, you should dot, 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 fill in the blank. I've always found that to be good advice for me. There are differences, but then again, a lot of this stuff, it applies equally to a man as it does to a woman. Is ladies first? Okay. Even if it's your boss or somebody who works for you? Well, what, I mean, what are we talking about, Bob? Like, are you talking about ladies first in the buffet line? Yes, please let me go first. I okay. <laughs> well, I don't know about that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Bob. Yeah. Is it, that is, uh, and I can only really, sp- I cannot speak for all women here. I can only speak really for my experience. So yeah, so I have this background in etiquette, like I'm a complete etiquette geek and I got all this train, this, all this, these certifications, which I loved and etiquette uh, is not, although it's perceived often as old fashioned, it is not gender specific. It's just about making people you interact with comfortable. I personally am never offended if somebody opens a door for me. I love it. Ladies first, if you're going to get me in the buffet line sooner and I get all the crab legs, yes, great. <laughs> so the, the I, where I personally get offended, <laughs> I am sure there's other women that might be thrilled by this, but in the old days when I used to travel a lot, and I'm sure we'll get back to traveling soon, is I'll have my, I'll be on getting on the airplane with my overnight bag and I'll pick it up. And a gentleman behind me will be like, do you need help with that? Do you want me to lift that for you? And I'm like, 
This to me is so offensive, but only because I work so hard and go to the gym every single day. Yeah. Yeah. Do I look like I need help? Oh, right. <laughs> no, this is why I lift every single day, right? No, I'm fine. And I'm the one helping women in front of me. Like, do you need sure. help? So I think that I truly believe ladies first is fine. Obviously you got to take a social cue from the ladies. If they've got a face of horror of like, how dare you offer to lift my bag, maybe yeah. you know, cut it down. Yeah. Otherwise it's just kind etiquette. The same way that I would hold a, a door for a gentleman who might be behind me. You know, and that's the thing when it comes to holding the door, if me and some of my employees are, you know, arrive at the building at the same time, I will jump to hold the door open for them. And just anybody really, I mean, you know, going into the 7-Eleven, whatever it is, I, I think there's just these basic components of etiquette or politeness. In the Navy, we say ship, shipmates, self, you know, there's nothing wrong with self-interest, but it's not first. And so interest in others, interest in others' well-being, I think is part of a leader's responsibility as well. So, you know, it's just an interesting discussion. I, I have worked for and with so many incredible women. It can be fun and it can be productive and you can really do great things if we don't draw sides and create these boundaries. And I think, you know, HR processes, and I think sometimes these boundaries just get created that are unnecessary, unfortunately. I agree with you on that one. I think sometimes women, I have found in my experience, have to be a little more specific or sometimes offer a little bit more information because of assumptions being made. And I'll go back to my airplane trips sure, or, sure, or any, sure. any interaction with new people. And oftentimes in, as you know, in a professional environment and, or a, a semi-professional environment. So it's a Thursday night, we're all on the airplane, everyone's going home for whatever. And I'll sit next to a gentleman in a business suit. Clearly, we're both coming from engagements and until ask, oh, what do you do? And I will say, oh, I, I own a communication skills training firm. Nine out of 10 times, the assumption is that is my solo consultancy. And they'll then ask, well, how, you know, how do you work with clients? Who are you coaching? And, and if I can get into then, no, actually, I have a staff of 25 trainers who go around the world and do this, that they're like, oh, oh, I, I assumed it was just your consultancy. I really want to ask like, what about this? Mm -hmm. Me and my business suit sitting in, maybe not first class, but like, you know, the extra room that says, I, I don't own a company. I don't know what you do, but maybe you own a company. So what, so I have found that sometimes we have to get very specific and if I'm yeah. in that environment, instead of saying I own a, I'll say, oh, I, I own a 25, yeah, you know, yeah. 30 person consultancy, blah, 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 blah. You know, that's a tricky one too, because especially after I got my business in motion, I would say I own, you know, I fly Virginia Beach indoor skydiving. I own my parent company that does the executive coaching and professional training. Right. And, and sometimes even to my own ears, Sometimes it just didn't sound right when I said I own. I guess I've learned to just kind of adapt how I deliver that based on the audience and the discussion and all that stuff. But what you're talking about in both of those examples, some people would call a microaggression. And that takes us to kind of the DE&I space, which is, which is front and center in the, in the workplace today. Oh, you're a female. Can I help you lift that bag? Why do you think I need help? You know, so that's somebody's just trying to be polite, but it's actually a microaggression. Or, or it could be considered that. I'm not saying it is or it isn't. Some people would consider it that. Or the gentleman who's sitting next to you who says, you know, thinks you're uh, less than what, what it really is, uh, that could be considered a microaggression as well. Mm -hmm. With that, I know when I read your bio, you also started a nonprofit called Be Ready to offer Ovation's professional presence training to Black youth of America. Can you talk about uh, how you do that, why you did that, and you know, have you seen any, any great successes? I'd love for you to share some success stories. Yes. Thank you for giving me a few moments to share about Be Ready. This is definitely a, a pandemic love project. <laughs> Again, something, it, it was a gift of time that allow and, and circumstance, although not such a gift to get this started. So remember when I was talking about those like one-on-ones with mm -hmm. the trainers that I was scheduling. So one of our trainers, Jason Sanford, who is a man of color had booked some time with me. He wanted to make eggs in a basket, you know, like the, the egg and a toast 
And uh, for, from V from Vandetta was, he said, I want to make eggs like V from Vandetta. So like, I'm already on the Zoom. I got my chef's coat on. I got my eggs ready to go. And we get on Zoom and he is like despondent. I mean, he's not his normal bubbly self. He's, he's not really looking at the camera at all. And I'm like, Jason, what? What's up? And he said, it's a hard day to be a black man. It was May 25th, I believe, of 2020. And it was the day that George Floyd was killed. I'm not often for a lack of words or a moment of leadership. And when I don't know what to do, I typically go towards what can I do and what, can I, what can I possibly do to make this better for you? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and he said, I'm so glad you asked. And he shared with me an idea of what if we offered our training to black youth? What if we could make a difference that way so that black youth were better prepared for interviews, for speaking publicly, for more confidently walking into places and having more of a confident presence. And I was, I was like, yeah, let's do it. So Jason Sanford, Tracy Lee, another trainer of ours and myself started this nonprofit arm of the company. Uh, we are partnering with my brother's keeper and starting with their New York City chapter and training these cohorts of young black men with our professional presence training. And we're able to offer this training to any groups of young, of black youth free of charge. Yeah, that's awesome. Is, do you have a, a target audience and age that you're looking for? Probably 12 to 18. Okay. Right okay. now, more of the high schoolers, perhaps going to job interviews, going to college interviews, those kind of things. Okay, good. You know, I'm on the DE&I committee for the Chamber of Commerce here in, in Virginia Beach. It's called the Hampton Roads Chamber of Commerce. You know, we look at things that we can do to economically disadvantage, you know, poverty, race and poverty travel together, as a good friend of mine says. And so we look at what we can do for economically disadvantaged youth and what you're doing is exactly the type of thing that we're looking to do. Handing somebody a bunch of money or creating an environment that's not realistic is just not going to benefit them. But to get that boots on the ground exposure, presentation skills, here's how, here's how you can have a great discussion with people. Here's how you can engage people. I think it's critical. I do something here called CTAC SOARS. And if the listeners out there want to just Google CTAC SOARS or go to YouTube and do, do a search for CTAC SOARS, you'll see exactly what we do. But the summary quite quickly is we have a Title I Achievable Dream Academy about four miles from iFly Virginia Beach. The school's great. A lot of these kids face challenges in their neighborhoods and in their homes. And we created a youth league program for them. It's a 13-week program. The school bus brings them here every Thursday at 3.30. We feed them. We have a speaker. You would be a great speaker for these kids if you ever find yourself in Virginia Beach. Or maybe we'll Zoom you in. But we speak to them, we feed them, and then we fly them. So over the 13-week period, they go from, I'm not sure I'm going to do that, to mom, dad, principal, look at me. Look at what I can do. It's That's just... Awesome. Yeah, it's the most incredible thing in the world. So, so Google CTAC source and you'll see the video. But what we're doing with these kids is we're instilling pride and confidence. These are fifth graders. So at the you know, 12, 11, 12 year old level, we're instilling pride and confidence. And for me, if we want to see a generational change, that's a key component. At that age, really putting these kids on an equal playing field and showing them that you, you, you can get out there and do it just like anybody else. And when they literally spread their wings in the flight chamber, it's, it's wonderful to see. So, so thanks for what you're doing there. We have just a few minutes left as our listeners are ending their workouts and their drives to work. You know, we want to keep the, the podcast in that time interval. Keep going. Get that heart rate up one last time. You've got this. <laughs> That's right. Well, there's so much to discuss. Um, so again, wrapping up our, our discussion on leadership, you know, we hit the kind of community involvement, which, which is critical for leaders and organizations, which is one of the great things that you're doing. We talked about the difference between men and women, and maybe the, the, there is a difference, but in often cases, there's just such great similarity. What is it that you would like people to know about you, your offering? How can they get in touch with you? You know, what, what haven't we covered here that you think is important? From a leadership standpoint, what has been very important and I believe critical to my success, or at this moment, I might call stamina. <laughs> <Yeah>. Sure. <laughs> they go hand in hand. 
Yes, is that I truly believe that what has kept me going is the, that I've surrounded myself with people that are smarter than I am. And who, and I'm not talking about IQ. I'm talking about where is, as somebody recently put it, their zone of genius is very different from mine. And it's so exciting for me to meet and work with somebody and be like, oh, I, I, that is not where I go. I, I don't know how to do that. And I'm so glad to hear here to do that with me or show me how that works. Um, and so I've been able to surround myself with people that are smarter than me. And then uh, very importantly, have mentors. So whether that's being part of EO Entrepreneurs Organization, I just became a member of WPO, which is Women's Presence Organization. So I ah. have a cohort of women that are, are there to support and, and uh, work and increase my knowledge and, and leadership skills there. And I also have a mentor through an organization called SCORE. Are you familiar with this, Bob, at all? Uh, I'm not familiar with SCORE. It is a, it's a totally free thing through the SBA. Uh, so if you go to the SBA website and you click on score, you can find an office near you. Or of course, I think that believe they're doing them all virtually now. And if you are an entrepreneur or thinking about starting a business or uh, that you can go on, they'll match you with somebody. And I just have had the opportunity to be mentored by a woman who had owned a training company years before, and it's like monthly therapy with her. So those are <laughs> critical, I think, to my current stamina. Some people would call those masterminds or the organization that I belong to, we call them councils. So yeah. I'm, a, I'm a member of the Thought Leader Council. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But you're right. Surrounding yourself by those people and having those other zones of experts, I think is what you said, or zone of brilliance. Zone or, of genius, right? Yeah, zone of genius, right. It's, um, you know, my zone of genius is so narrow and so limited. Right, me too. Uh, but, but to be exposed to all those others, it's refreshing and it's... Yeah. it's really what I think leaders should do. Leaders need to interact with other leaders. They need to have the discussion that you and I are having right now because ultimately we enrich each other through the process. Yeah. So, so you're right. Belong to those things. Okay. What else? Oh, and then for me, I'm, I'm pretty, I made it very easy to find me. <laughs> so if you want to check out what Ovation does, it, you can simply go to getovation.com, learn about our professional presence and speaker development offerings. If you are an individual and you want to get some training right away, we have a brand new offering called Studio G and that it's a monthly learning platform. You get live weekly workshops, depending on what level you engage, you can get one-on-one -on -one coaching, lots of resources. So that's for, that's our B2C product. And you can come and immediately get better in professional presence, speaker development. And also, so you can get to that through our website or get studioG.com. And then finally, if you'd like to know more about our mission for Be Ready, you can go to getbeready.org. Do you see the theme? It's like get ovation, <laughs> get Studio G, get Be Ready. Of course, I'm easy to find and welcome a connection on LinkedIn or Facebook. And every Tuesday I do lives on both of those platforms with little tiny, I mean, like they're 12 minute little snippets of me talking about all things professional presence, speaker development, how to rehearse with accountability, uh, and sharing my zone of genius, for lack of a better term. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, everybody has their their little zone of genius. So oh, yeah. that's great. No, that's great, Carrie. Uh, you know, key things, I would say in my leader development, I've attended many training events similar to your offerings. And it's night and day. You know, there was there was Bob before all that. And then there's Bob after all that. Now, Bob is still a work in progress. Always. But, yeah, always. Exactly. But, you know, my level of comfort being in front of a group or or making that sales pitch or that sales presentation, or, you know, having that difficult discussion, all of the things we've talked about, so true, they apply. And so I encourage our listeners to get a hold of Carrie. And, um, and although we haven't met in person and hung around each other, I bet you're fun to hang around as well. I'm pretty fun. <laughs> And not yet. And if I get to Virginia Beach, I'm certainly going to let you know because I want to check out your stuff. So yeah, yeah, you'll have a blast, especially bring your bring your family down here. And uh, yes, you know, absolutely. We'll, we'll, you guys will uh, will never forget it. It's a it's a lifelong memory. Wonderful. So, all right, Carrie Garbus, wonderful to talk to you. Thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to your success.
You are welcome. I look forward to my success as well. And thank you for this time. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Elevate Your Leadership podcast. To contact Bob directly or to learn more about how Bob can advance you and your organization through leadership training, team building, executive coaching, and public speaking, visit robertpizzini.com. Robert, P-I-Z-Z-I-N-I.com and connect with him on LinkedIn.